tipped in the air and knocked away. KU's got to win it. <laughs> Blah, big time two-hand slam by Hunter Dickinson. Kansas is the 2023 WNIT champions. This is the Jayhawker Podcast. Presented by the University of Kansas Health System. Here we are once again, the Jayhawker podcast. I am Greg Gurley along with Wayne Simeon on this crazy state we live in weather-wise. Uh, another, about to be another 70 degree, degree day after a 15 degree day with some snow. Crazy. Don't get it. And that's exactly why our women's golf team went to Arizona. Our men's team was in Palm Springs. But we still have to be here for all things Jayhawks. Uh, the Jayhawker podcast brought to you by the University of Kansas Health System, Xfinity, and Black and & Veatch. I am joined, as always, by the legendary Wayne Simeon, here to talk all things KU. But I think the best way to start it here on this Friday was yesterday. Big news coming out of the Wagnon Student Center, a new contract for our football coach, Lance Leipold. Yeah, great day for the Jayhawks. Obviously a a momentous day for Coach Leipold, his family, and that football program uh, continuing to just build off the momentum that's taken place uh, ever since his arrival. And uh, a new deal, a new contract, uh, very impressive. Uh, going to uh, lock him in, uh, so to speak, for uh, years to come as we continue to see uh, Kansas football climb up on a the national scene, uh, both in uh, respect, uh, both in uh, outcomes and wins, and then, of course, in the establishment of having one of the top head coaches in all the country. Well, and the backing by Travis Goff and this administration to – Get Lance where he needs to be, uh, financially, salary wise. Going to make seven million dollars, and it's been a, a an unbelievable rise. Uh, got it done in year one, improved in year two dramatically. Back to back bowl seasons, uh, Liberty Bowl was awesome, and then you win the guaranteed rate bowl. Kept all of his coaches until this year, which is something you and I talked about last week that. Hey, that comes with success. It was very rare that we kept all 10 or 11 assistant coaches two years ago. When you're good, people are going to come and try to pluck off the pieces, and they did. But, you know, they talked about it in the press conference today that those all three of those guys are still great friends of Lance, and they offered them great packages to stay, and they made the decision to leave. And uh, but, But what that tells you is that we are behind football, in many ways, you know, it was about time that we had a press conference just to catch up with everything from how everything ended, how the stadium is now knocked down, how the gateway project is moving forward, contracts, where the team is. They've kind of had to be relocated to to train while the Anderson family complex is getting a, a massive makeover. It's not even a makeover. It's a it's a. a expansion to sign of the times. And so it was great that Lance got up there and you can catch that podcast, excuse me, that press conference, wherever you, you know, social media, it's all out there, but it's worth a listen. Uh, Travis and his staff have, have done a, a great job of, of keeping the core and then giving our fan base something to be excited about by retaining coaches, by having a great NIL program, by changing the stadium atmosphere, it's, we're, we're going to have the nicest stadium in the country. Wayne, you and I sit over in that preview center and, and watch the, the people's reaction when they see the renderings and what it's going to look like, whether that be in the Anderson Complex or in the new David Booth Memorial Stadium. And I just can't wait for, what is that, 18 to 20 months from now when it's all done in August of uh, 25. Yeah, it was really good uh, in that press conference with both uh, Travis and Lance speaking. And uh, one of the things that really caught my attention in terms of of, of Travis Goff's remarks is uh, the satisfaction uh, that he gets in the challenge of retaining coaches, not just hiring coaches, uh, but retaining coaches. And we know that his track record in 
uh, hiring coaches and not just Lance Leipold, but uh, but a Lindsey Cool, a Nate Lee, a Dan Fitzgerald, uh, all uh, are stepping up, um, you know, at, at very high competitive levels. Uh, that can be exciting. And, and it's one thing that shines well on an athletic director's resume. But you got a candidate pool of multiple people that are vying to be able to uh, lead a program or um you know uh, uh, uh or to lead uh, to lead our uh, sports program here at KU but it is interesting that dynamic and I hadn't quite thought about it before uh in retaining a, a coach you know in fending and fighting off other schools uh and just the, the competitive nature uh that is a uh, is is alive when it comes to making sure that uh Kansas is the best place that offers the best package that that presents the best opportunities uh, in in the midst of other schools trying to to lure away your coach and and I also thought it was pretty cool to note that that Lance hinted at the deal being as good as done back in December uh, and we know the kind of the coaching carousel that took place in January and February and of course Lance's name is thrown out there for every big time job that's open uh, but for the most part it sounded like this deal was as good as done in de in December. Uh, but yet there was some thought and some consideration in when to announce it, you know, uh, and I thought it was very noble uh, not wanting to take away uh, the shine or the notoriety with his players in getting uh, postseason accolades and getting invited to the senior bowl and being NFL combine candidates, uh, being aware of what's happening uh, in Kansas athletics around our basketball programs and not wanting to compete or take away. Uh, what's going on uh, with them in those moments, but but finding an appropriate time uh, to release it, I thought uh, was very very impressive uh, holistically, both from Travis and Lance uh, in 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 releasing this this good news for for Jayhawk Nation. Hundred percent, yeah. And, and again, our administration and our staffs and, and the camaraderie that we show around there. You and I just had a all staff meeting yesterday, and it's just it's fun, you know all sports it's not just football it's not just basketball tons of success you mentioned it there with with lindsey cool our women's golf team goes out to arizona last week and wins 43 under as a combined group out in westbrook village to get their first win of the year so i don't, I don't think i've ever in just to show extra love to the women's golf program i don't think i've ever seen record breaking associated with a program as much as it has been with coach Lindsey cool's program in these first two years i mean it seems like every single outing there's some type of record being broken uh and it certainly has shows that they're they're, they're not gonna go to be trying to slow down anytime soon with uh, with what they've got going on there yeah i mean we talked about it last week with the men's team getting a second place finish and then and winning we talked about how like crazy it is when you win an individual title in a golf tournament that's really really hard to do it's also really hard to win it as a team because everybody's got to be on the same page and and play uh, above their level and at a, at a in a way to shoot 43 under crazy so congrats to coach cool and all of our women's golfers uh, the men will be back on the road here in a couple weeks uh talked football uh in our next segment wayne got to sit down with our superstar freshman uh and a near and dear to my heart as she's a shawnee mission you know i know i know an old sunflower league right you know you're you remember the old sunflower league right yeah no it's true kansas city girl shawnee mission west so it was uh great to to highlight her it's coming off uh Great performance against uh, in-state rival K-State, uh, leading a big win over a top-ranked uh, opponent there in the field house. And I think they've won seven out of their last eight, uh, making a huge charge into March, bolstering their uh, resume and candidacy to be able to be a tournament team yet again. Yeah, and and they really uh, used the, the Women's NIT Championship and – took that momentum and and really at the beginning of the year if you look at their record it you know it was a struggle because they were playing big time competition and not always winning but they wanted to build that NCAA tournament resume by playing against some of the best in the country because we were left on the outside looking in by just the smallest of margins and Brandon Snyder and his staff decided 
well, I guess we got to play some, some bigger schools that have the better net and all the other stuff. And they did that this year, and that's helped them in the Big 12. A bit of a peaks and valleys type of year, if you look at it, as far as wins and losses, you know it better than anybody. And uh, I'm anxious to hear uh, from Samaya, who's just been so good. I mean, there hasn't been a, a better freshman in this league. She's been unbelievable and uh, uh, has carried this team to seven out of eight. Just a couple nights ago, went down that long road trip down to Orlando and knocked off Central Florida on a game that they were supposed to win, but you still got to go and do it. And when we talk about, you know, here in a couple segments from now, when we talk about the men's, that's kind of why we're at where we're at is they didn't win the games they were supposed to win. And, and they, uh, Brandon and the girls took care of business a couple nights ago. They get Oklahoma this upcoming weekend. And uh, and then for those of you that don't know, the, the men's and the women's Big 12 tournament has, has separated. It used to be, you know, pretty much the same time, same city and all that. The women's Big 12 tournament starts next week. So Saturday will be the season finale. But let's let's go to Samaya Nichols and Wayne Simeon to talk a little women's basketball here on the Jayhawker podcast. I'm what you might call very good at hide and seek. This one time, my parents had to round up the whole neighborhood to track me down. It was a mess. A lot of tears. Well, now that we got Xfinity, we have Wi-Fi all over the house including all my favorite super secret hiding spots. So I can kill time in here by streaming my shows and- Ha, found ya. The heck? How? You left to find my tablet on. This generation, ruining the game with their performance enhancers. Get wall-to-wall Wi-Fi on the Xfinity 10G network for a reliable connection throughout your home. Now through March 21st, new customers can get started with 200 megabit internet for $25 a month for two years with no annual contract and get Wi-Fi equipment included. Go to Xfinity.com, call 1-800-XFINITY, or visit a store today. Requires paperless plan auto pay with stored bank account. Restrictions apply. Taxes and fees extra. After promo, regular rates apply to internet service and Wi-Fi equipment. Actual speeds vary. Xfinity 10G network brings improved speed, security, reliability, and latency. Xfinity 10 gigabit service tier subject to permitting and construction requirements. All right, welcome back to the Jayhawker podcast. Have with me a special guest today, star freshman, not rising star, a solidified star a uh, freshman guard for uh, the Kansas women's basketball program uh, who's on a tear right now, winning seven of their last eight, uh, bolstering their resume to get into the tournament. And a Kansas City product, uh, five-star recruit, Samaya Nichols. Samaya, thanks so much for being on with us today. Thanks for having me. Hey, so a part of uh, this huge tear that your team is on here in the month of February has in large part been anchored by your performance with a team leading 15 points a game and coming off a 22 point performance and an upset win over in-state rival uh, K-State. Hey, tell us a little bit about what you attribute uh, not only the team's recent success in the month of February, but also your success individually these last couple games. Yeah, um, I feel like I've really, I feel like I've made like a statement on how bad I really want to win when it comes to just being in practices, you know. Um, I've never been a practice player, but I just feel like out of nowhere, when I say practice player, I mean like just like a good practice person, you know, like some people just like, they just practice nonchalantly because it's practice, but I feel like I've really had um, a competitive motive in practice, just showing how bad I wanted to win. And I feel like the whole team has really locked in and bought in. And that has really contributed to our seven out of eight wins. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, Kansas City native, all right, from Shawnee Mission uh, Southwest, uh, or Shawnee Mission West, the Vikings. Sorry about that. Go go, go Sunflower League. And uh, the first five-star recruit uh, that uh, the women's program has had and so you're coming in local products uh, with expectations and you're meeting and even exceeding some of those expectations. What was it like being uh, a local girl from Kansas wanting to come here, represent and then live up to those expectations? You know, it was exciting, um, especially when I know a lot of my family can come up and watch me. Um, I feel like a Kansas women's basketball is definitely on the rise. Um, and I wanted to be a part of a rebuilt brand, you know, making them and contribute 
contributing to like a top 10 team, you know, and uh, I feel like why wouldn't I go to a school, especially in a state that represented me and built me as a person. And that's basically like me giving back. Well, take us back to that signature win over over Kansas State again uh, with your 22 point performance. But as I got a chance to sit courtside and watch that, I was impressed by the toughness that you showed during that time because you took some big hits uh, during that game. Three specifically that I remember that under normal circumstances, probably a player would have asked to be checked out of the game, maybe not even come back but you stuck it out, stayed in there, and continued to fight and lead your team to victory. So talk to us about your toughness. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was really a, an adrenaline game for one, you know. Um, it's like Kansas versus Kansas. And uh, you always want to be the best one. You want to be the winner. And I feel like no matter the pain, the hit, winning was going to top that feeling, you know. And even thinking uh, a little bit more about uh, that game, one of the signature attributes of your game individually is your versatility. Someone that can play uh, positions one through four, someone that can guard multiple positions. You're a three level scorer. You can shoot the three. You've got a great mid range. You hit, you know, three consecutive shots uh, right in a row, right there from the elbow in a, in a drop coverage situation. You can get all the way to the rim. Uh, finish in traffic, get fouled. Uh, so talk to us about your versatility and where where, and how did you develop that? Yes, um, that basically, that really started in like AAU, probably eighth grade when I was really aware of my size, you know? And uh, as a player, you wanna try and do anything to stay on the court, you know? So if I had to go guard a post player, a forward, a guard, you know? or if I had to play a different position in a play, that's what I was gonna do. Um, uh, my motive was mostly just to, by any means, stay on the court as much as I can and do what I can in any position. Well, you're certainly doing that as you're uh, not only one of the, the leading scorers for uh, the Jayhawks, but also uh, leading them in minutes played categories. They need you to be on that court, uh, leading the way, even as a freshman, as we think about uh, that Kansas State win, uh, there was a special someone that was in the crowd uh, being honored, cheering you on that day, and she got a chance to drop back and to visit you guys in the locker room. And I'm speaking none other than the legendary Lynette Woodard, who's on the Mount Rushmore, not only of uh, Kansas athletes all time, but in, in women's basketball history. And so what was it like being able to see her courtside as you're out there doing your thing? and then also to be able to hear from her uh, after after the game. Yes. Um, honestly, it was very surreal. For some reason, I was just like fangirling. Like, not for some reason, because she deserves all the fangirls. But I was just fangirling the whole time. I was just like staring at her, just like stargazing. Um, really couldn't believe that she was just in there with us. And she was just excited as us. She gave us even more energy, especially after the game, just saying how we represented Kansas well, and uh, we um, held it down in Allen, and just, she was really just screaming at us, but like that energetic scream, and we were all just energetic, and again, just amazed that she was sitting right in front of us, just talking to us. Man, will you talk about you being a fan of hers, and obviously the historic numbers that she was able uh, to put up here uh, as a player, and even as a professional. Your name is being mentioned uh, with hers in the same sentence as uh, all-time freshman scoring leaders here at the University of Kansas, and and there's plenty of basketball left for you to be able to play here this season, and so it'll continue to be great to to have you build upon that. And uh, of course, the environment was great that we saw there last Sunday against K State. And guess what? You're going to need those home fans to be able to come out uh, this Saturday to watch you guys take on. Uh, the Big 12 champions as they clinch yeah. uh, the regular season championship, Oklahoma Sooners. Mm -hmm. uh, how much, how important is it going to be for you to have our fans come out and to support you, uh, not only in your last home game, a senior night game, uh, but also to make sure that they show up in Kansas City as you guys uh, transition uh, your uh, court playing there in that tournament to the T-Mobile Arena? Yes, um, our fans are very important. 
um, we value them a lot. And uh, they don't know the big impact they have in the game, especially when their energy is feeding on us and our energy is feeding on them. And they really help with our momentum. And then, of course, it is very important this coming weekend, especially when we are playing for our seniors and trying to go get a really big one for our seniors as well. And um, Casey, of course, like we need everyone. And we're in Kansas, you know, so like why not we have the most fans as we can. That's great. Talk to us a little bit about your seniors as you're mm -hmm. playing with some signature seniors that have done uh, a lot of incredible things, uh, of not only leading the team to the WNIT championship, last season of course leading them to uh ncaa tournament berth and win two seasons ago but like some real record breakers some record setters yeah. with tahana jackson and the shot blocking record and uh zakai franklin and creeping up that all-time scoring record as well and uh, holly kerskeeter was the a sharp shooter all-time three-pointers made what, what has it been like playing with this group of dynamic seniors you know they are great both on and off the court um we can start off the court because they're, they're just hilarious, you know? They never make you feel less than. Um, I've never felt like I was younger, honestly. I feel like we're all the same age. Um, and off the court, they're always encouraging, you know? Um, they're for you whenever you need a call, whenever you wanna come over, um, if you need to go eat lunch, that they're going automatically. And then on the court, um, I mean, they're, they're leaders, you know? They've been there plenty of times and um, they like, how do I explain this? They just, they have such a great drive for the game, you know? Um, and you can tell they know their why, if that makes sense when they play, you know? And um, for, for they for sure play for each other, you know? They're not playing because oh, it's our last year, so we're just going to play and do whatever, or I'm just going to play for this specific person because that's my favorite or that's my best friend. Like, we play for each other, for sure, and I can definitely see that in our um, in our bets. Yeah, well, certainly shown here uh, in the recent month as you guys have gone on a tear again uh, on a nice winning streak and finishing out conference play, and, and, and you and I both know that quite wasn't the case uh, as we started things out, as you guys had the number one strength of schedule in the country, uh, getting off to a little bit of a, of a slower start. Hey, brag a little bit about your head coach and some of the adjustments that uh, he made in helping uh, kind of spark you guys on uh, this hot streak that you're on, and then maybe even share with us about uh, the recruiting process and how uh, he did a great job of, of drawing you here to become a Jayhawk. Yes, we'll start with the recruiting process. Okay, so um, honestly, I've always loved KU, and I feel like I feel like I always had him on like this little cliffhanger, you know. And I, I never meant to. It was just, you know, that's your first cliffhanger is in like whether you're gonna whether yes. you're gonna be, be here or not. Okay. <laughs> and I never really meant to do that. It's just like when you're younger, that's like your first big decision like that's the first decision you have to make on your own and no one else can make it for you and i was always looking to my mom and like mom where am i going like i just you know you need your parent to tell you everything and i was looking for my mom to tell me like you should go this place you should go this place but anyways um i've always wanted to go to kansas i honestly should have committed a long time ago before i committed you know but um they recruited me so well since the seventh grade they were all they were at all of my Phenom games. And I guess another thing that stands out the most when it comes to those games is coaches, they travel in like a pack of three or four when they go to um, the tournaments, you know, so they can like cover a good amount of games. At the same right. time. And there's normally like a hundred courts. So they need to get to a whole bunch of courts and all four of them would be at my game and they're like sitting front row. <laughs> And they're like, they're watching me warm up too. They're like, they're not coming as soon as the buzzer goes off and it's time to play and it's time to jump the ball. Like they're watching me warm up. We're in the layup lines and it is all four of them. Like they're not going to go see anybody else. And that that just really stood out to me. Now my head coach, um, Brandon, of course. Um, I love Brandon, um, very great person off the court and on the court as well. Um, I love how he can just switch it up. You know, he is very, 
off the court, he's like a dad, you know, um, getting things done for you and problem with your car, he'll fix it, you know. And then on the court, he's like um, very competitive, you know, and I feel like he's really done a good job just like learning how I play and putting me in the good positions that I need to be in to basically help the team. That's great. I love that imagery that you showed there with all four of those assistants uh, there watching you. And it's it's great to be able to see that the potential that they recognize in you as a high school player is now fully coming to fruition here uh, in Allen Fieldhouse on a nightly basis. Uh, and also a big shout out to, to my friend. And, 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 and I think he coached you also, uh, Ter Terry Nooner, mm -hmm. who's a, a Jayhawk and currently the, the head women's coach down at Wichita State. I know he was uh, highly involved uh, in that as well. And so that was that's great to be able to, to have uh, that Jayhawk connection there. And so finally, as uh, you mentioned, we're getting ready to go to Kansas City. You mentioned uh, loving and watching KU as you were growing up. Give a big shout out. What would you say to this younger and up and coming generation of high school and junior high Kansas City area basketball players? I'm a KC guy, too. So we want to make sure we represent and uh, and draw uh, some of those uh, some of that talent here. But what would you say to the up and coming uh, talent here in the Kansas City area uh, about reaching their goals and aspirations uh, on the basketball court? Uh, very much like you've done only in one year. Mm -hmm. Definitely, don't limit yourself. Um, I feel like you can do anything beyond measures. And also, something really important is to just don't compare yourself to others. If you want to compare yourself to anything, it should be yourself maybe a year ago and hoping you see a difference within yourself. But you should only be competing against yourself for real. And then you compete on the court or on the field or on whatever you're doing when it comes down to playing the game. Wow, wise words there by, by a freshman, air quote right there. And I can see by that mature answer why uh, Coach Snyder and his staff are so confident in giving you that basketball and let you take the charge and lead uh, with this team. So continue to lead well. Uh, all the best against uh, uh, the Sooners here this weekend and in Kansas City and far into March. And the Jayhawk Nation will be cheering you on. So thanks so much for coming on to my Rock Chalk. Rock Chalk, thank you. I had this patient. His cancer treatment had him in the hospital for a while. One day, he was telling me about his grandson and how a big night was coming up for him. So we arranged to make it a big night for my patient too. I sometimes wonder if I'm doing all I can. Then I help make a moment like this possible. And I know I am. And we're back here on the Jacker Podcast brought to you by the University of Kansas Health System, Xfinity and Black and Veach, great sponsors of this program. What a great segment and love that uh, you were able to sit down with the star of the Big 12 right now as far as newcomers are concerned. And, and not just a newcomer, but one of the best players, not, not the best newcomer, one of the best players in the Big 12. And it's so important for Brandon Snyder and his staff to go out and get the best talent there is. And it's so much nicer when they're 30 minutes away. Yeah, you know, it really is. And, and when we think about the, the senior day that's coming up for that women's basketball program, you're losing players that have been here four plus years, like a Holly Kurskeeter, like a Zakiya Franklin. And you're thinking, man, how do you refill the cupboard talent wise? And I tell you what, Samaya Nichols is not only the type of player uh, that is living up to that five star hype that she came in here with, but she is the type of player that you can build around for the future. And so even though they're going to be losing some significant contributors uh, from uh, this nice little postseason uh, runs that they've had these last two years, uh, Samaya Nichols is one that, that can really uh, lead things forward, uh, not only with her skill and her ability, but guess what? She's the type of player that other players are going to want to join here in Lawrence and continue to wreak havoc in the Big 12. And one last thing before we move on from women's basketball, the whole country has been engaged with Caitlin Clark, right? All-time leading scorer and all that. Unbelievable. 
what she does and, and, and brings attention to the sport. I love it. I love it. But what happened in the last couple of weeks with her passing Kelsey Plum was it brought up Lynette Woodard and it brought up what she did so many years ago, which is unbelievable. I mean, no three point line and what was it? 3,649, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy because I guess I should know how many three pointers Caitlin Clark has made, but I got to think it's in the five hundreds, let's say. And Lynette Woodard would have had hundreds of more points if there was a three point line. Uh, I thought uh, Scott Van Pelt did a segment. You and I saw it in the all staff meeting where he talked about how ridiculous it is that Lynette Woodard's record isn't recognized. Now I say right. We all recognize it. I think the country does, but it was because the NCAA wasn't the governing body of women's basketball back when Lynette played, which whatever. I mean, I get it. I mean, but it just sounds stupid. And Scott Van Pelt uh, did a nice segment on it. And really what it did, I think, selfishly for me and you and all Kansas Jayhawks is that it put the the you know it up there in everyone's mind about Kansas basketball and Lynette Woodard, and she deserves it. Yeah, yeah, she certainly does. And this uh, by no means is a knock on what Caitlin Clark has done and is doing, not just for women's basketball, but for the game of basketball as a whole. She's a she's a, a phenomenal talent, a generational talent and, and, and a ton of fun to watch and good for the game. Uh, but it is nice to be able to highlight uh, one of ours uh, and L L Lynette Woodard and, you know, a lot's being made of her uh, point totals. But she had and accumulated over 1,700 rebounds, okay? Rebound, one at a time, rebounds. There, there, there are players that we have here that are in the top 10, uh, both on the men's and women's side in scoring that don't surpass the amount of rebounds that Lynette Woodard had. And so if that just helps to be able to expand the type of impact that she had on the game, the type of player that she was, I'm not really sure what does, and and um, and it's great not only to be able to highlight her in that moment, but also one of her coaches as Marion Washington is yet again on the ballot for uh, the the Naismith Hall of Fame, uh, which of course here in Lawrence we're all uh, very hopeful and trying to do our part to make sure uh, that she will have a place of recognition in Springfield along with Lynette Woodard. Yeah, and and the one last thing about this is I think it just it demeans what so many women accomplished in the sport because their records aren't looked at as records because it wasn't part of the NCAA and I think it's a I don't know who has to make that decision for them to pull back the AIWA or whatever it was to pull it into that but that ship has sailed I guess but uh, it was it was kind of neat and I completely agree with you what Caitlin Clark has done as far as the interest in basketball, not just women's basketball. Obviously, that's a huge part of it, but everybody's watching. It ain't it ain't just uh, women basketball fans. It's everybody, whether you're in the NBA, whether you play uh, on the men's team here. It, it, everyone's captivated by what she's done, and she's she's a lot of fun to watch. And uh, uh, so, anyway, uh, Lynette Woodard, legendary Kansas Jayhawk, and in my book. Uh, still has one of the greatest uh, accolades ever. She's the first female to ever play on the Harlem Globetrotters. And she always have that. So on to the men's team. Uh, earlier this week had uh, something that we're not used to because we're greedy and we're spoiled because we're not used to losing at home when we have a lead at half or we don't have a lead at half. Doesn't matter. We just don't do it, right? Give BYU a ton of credit. Came in here and whooped us. They made shots. We didn't. Obviously, the free throw line and the three-point line were the biggest stories of the night. Uh, but they made shots. And uh, things didn't go our way. And that was self-inflicted. Um, so it's frustrating. It's gut check time. Bill talked about it in his press conference yesterday that watching the film, it wasn't as bad as he thought after watching it live, but results are the same. Uh, just some things rammed in and out, wasn't bouncing our way. 
they got the switches when they wanted it and they took advantage of some mismatches and bottom line is they made shots. We took the lead at 56 to 50 after their coach, Mark Pope got a technical foul after a charge called on them that would have tied the game up. So instead of a tie game, we go, we get two free throws technical on Pope. And then we get a, uh, an alley-oop to Parker Brown. The only uh, bench points of the day, or I think maybe we, got, we might have had four, but it was something that, again, give BYU a ton of credit. They didn't just put their chin down. They came back and took the game from us in our building. Yeah, it was interesting uh, hearing that feedback from Coach and that the, the tape didn't look as bad as maybe it did live. And, you know, it's kind of a, a, an old saying in basketball circles, when you watch the film, it's never as good as you think it is and it's never as bad as maybe you thought it was. But to your point, uh, you know, the result remains the same in a uh, a difficult loss in the field house. But, but Greg, maybe not a surprising loss. Maybe, you know, that wasn't as surprising uh, to some folks uh, as it was because, I mean, BYU is a dangerous, dangerous team. 20 wins, that, that, that win for them in the field house was their 20th win, even though it looked like they were a 7-7 seven and seven, uh, kind of middle-of-the-pack conference team coming in here. Uh, but I think they had been punching above their weight class. And, and when you have a dangerous team like that, whose MO is to volume shoot from the three-point line, and we've seen it in this era of basketball, it has a way of always keeping you in the game. I mean, even when we got up, you know, double digits, you know, when you have that three-point equalizer and our inability to score from behind the three-point line, uh, it, it, it felt like we didn't quite have enough separation um, to, to, to keep us there. And I thought we were good once we got into the bonus with 10 minutes left. Um, certainly, no, we got it. We were in the double bonus at like the 13 minute mark. Okay, yeah, yeah. Certainly didn't forecast the bad free throw shooting, you know, that that, that we had there. Um, uh, but then once they got a to the career, bonus, Hunter's a career 74% free throw shooter. So it's not physical, it's mental. And yeah. They, and they just one turned into two, two turned into six, right? And there were some missed bunnies in there too, which probably compounded that, you know, between between his ears and uh, you know, the law of averages kind of played out. They didn't hit, you know, all they did, all their threes early in the first half. You were kind of waiting, man. It's only a matter of time before they hit, you know, three to five, get things going and get back in. And then they got to the free throw line. We got behind. We got desperate. We had to foul. They made free throws. We couldn't get easy baskets. Uh, and we found ourselves uh, in, in a vulnerable position and, and letting one uh, letting one get away. And, and certainly not the type of, of, of mindset that we want to have going on the road against a team that we're fighting against for Big 12 tournament seating position in, in a new arena that I hear is, is far more hostile than their old arena that uh, we're used to playing in. Yeah, and, you know, going back to a couple of things you said, uh, when you said some of us weren't surprised, and I think it's guys like you and me and Bill, I don't think we were surprised by the outcome because I think you and I know what we are and we know where our flaws are. We know where our strengths are. So the, the outcome wasn't necessarily surprising because we knew that this could happen throughout the year. And it has, especially when you play against an old team. How many times have we heard Bill Self talk about getting old and staying old? Well, when you coach at BYU, most of your guys are old. <laughs> They're all, they got kids and they're married and it's just, you know, whatever that means as far as their maturity, their basketball IQ, they're just been around longer. And, and so they took advantage of some things that uh, other teams may not have. Uh, they, they got, they played the matchups. Uh, they made their free throws. They made their throws. We knew they were going to shoot mid thirties from the three point line. It's just, we thought we were going to shoot a little bit better. Johnny Furphy had an off night. Nick Timberlake's one and nine. I mean, we made a couple threes late in the game, but and, and when we hit, we kicked, we kicked a couple in. We kicked a couple late in. Uh, I don't know if you can call those real game rhythm kind of signature threes. They they, they were kind of some, some junk threes that we had there. No, no, you're exactly right because it was Hunter after missing six free throws. His next shot, he made a three, and everyone's yeah, like, well, Jamari, Jamari kicked make one in, and, and I think Nick hit one late. Yeah, yeah. So we're not gonna we're not gonna make our hay. From a three-point line, that's 
If you can't tell that after about 30 games and you don't know basketball, we are who we are. We're going to have to be very efficient inside the arc, throw a few in. We're going to have to defend the three-point line, and we got to ride Hunter. And especially when Kevin's not there, we have to ride Hunter. Say what you want to say about his performance on Tuesday. Saturday, the game plan doesn't change. We got to continue to get the ball to Hunter, let the offense go through him, and then you build it out when they double or triple team. I thought what BYU did a great job of, they always took that weak side guy, and whenever we like to you know, fake it out front, throw it over the top, that weak side guy was on the block that took that away. It's basically say, oh, Kansas, skip the ball to the corner. We'll take our chances with your three-point shooters. And it worked. And I, I've actually been pretty surprised that more teams haven't done that because we've made a living throwing it over the top, bucket, throwing it over the top, bucket, right? And so they took that away. And so what's your plan B? And our plan B made us three threes, and we got outscored from the three-point line by 30. And that's really, really hard to make up. Let's put a bow on that. No, not a bow. What, what can we put on something that's bad? A lock. Put a lock on that. Put a lock on that. And forget I like it about it and move on. Let's throw it in the in the chest of drawers. Put a lock on it and forget it. And understand, like you just said, we're going to Baylor, where we've had a lot of success over the years, but we've also – it's been a very difficult place to play. They're one of the best five to ten teams in the country year in and year out, at least over this past seven, eight years. Tough place to play. they got a brand-new building, uh, seats 7,500. Their old building, the Ferrell Center, was about 11-3, 11-5. So uh, it shows you the trend that places are going smaller – and it's going to be loud. It's going to have sweets and all that, and they hate us. I mean, every time we go, there's that that annoying guy that uh, uh, he I don't know where they'll seat him, but he has like a dry erase board that with a marker that he brings, and he writes different messages, and he runs down to our bench and puts it in front of Bill's face. He's I don't know what his name is, but he's probably some sort of successful individual because he sits like fifth row behind our bench, but he is uh, uh, always there, and I'll curious where he'll be on Saturday, but uh, I always enjoy that kind of until he writes something that's super mean, but uh, uh, they're good. They're not uh, happy with us because they thought that we kind of stole one from them in Lawrence just a couple of weeks ago. And I would probably not disagree with them. Like we gave them every opportunity to beat us in outfield house and they just missed shots. They end up losing by three. Remember, that was the one that we kind of like, God, how do we win that one? Yeah, last 30 seconds, last three-play stretch was basically trying to serve it up on a silver platter to them. And uh, Nick Nick Timberlake had a couple of difficult possessions there. And, and, and Misi was really, really tough matchup uh, for Hunter, uh, who, who he's been playing very well uh, also. And, uh, you know, plays above the rim, long, lanky, athletic, um, you know, a lob threats. Uh, and they've got shooters all around them. And this is one of the most uh, prolific offensive teams uh, in the Big 12, if not the country. And they can fill it up. And, and even though they struggled a little bit here in Lawrence, uh, we know that uh, that basketball, when you get at home, usually gets even that basket gets even bigger. And so uh, I expect it to well, be. A pretty big offensive barrage there, and 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 our guys are going to have to bring their defensive toughness and mindset. They're going to have to weather some runs, man. I'm telling you, there's going to be times where Baylor's going to go on the you know the a six point run, a nine three run. I mean, there's going to be some some big time runs that are going to happen in that environment that we're really going to have to weather. So I think that's going to be the thing that I'm looking for, and and, and probably the key to the game from my vantage point is do we have uh, the endurance and the mental toughness to weather a, a run of getting down maybe uh, double digits, 11 points, uh, maybe in the first half, and can we cut it to single digits before we go into half, and can we get a fast start, as you and I have talked about, uh, coming out of that second half before that first uh, four-minute timeout um, in, in, in media. And so I think those are going to be some things that are going to be really, really important for the Jayhawks to drill down on if they want to pull one out of Waco. Well, you said it best, you know, they're back at home and we we're the best example of a team that plays at a different level at home. Baylor will play at a different level at home. They're comfortable. We haven't proved 
We've only proved it, well, three times that we can win on the road, and that's twice in the state of Oklahoma and at Indiana, and those aren't exactly NCAA tournament teams. Oklahoma probably will be, but that's about it. So we've got to go do what we haven't really proved that we can do yet. Doesn't mean we can't do it. Doesn't mean we're going to play from out front all day, but to your point, we're going to, there's going to be a run, and, and they're going to play well. We just have to match their intensity. We've got to be focused. We've got to take care of the ball. We can't afford some of the mistakes and the mental mistakes that we had on Tuesday night against BYU. Uh, they're probably going to have uh, one of the best freshmen in the league back. He didn't play against us when we were in Lawrence Langston Love. And so uh, they might have some more weapons. Um, and we might have, well, I guess Kevin didn't play in that game, but we, I – I guess we can hold out hope that Kevin can play on Saturday. We'll know more about practice and how he does. Bill talked about it in his press conference and said, I'm not going to play someone that doesn't practice. And so we'll find out when we head to Waco later today. Um, so, you know, here it is. Dog days of the Big 12, the gauntlet, whatever you want to call it. Hey, I know we feel sorry for ourselves. Hey, this is tough travel, but. Everybody does it. We all play the same amount of road games. We all play the same amount of home games. Some of the schedules are a little bit skewed because of who you are and the tougher place you have to play. It'll come back to us next year. All right, we got to finish the season Saturday in Waco and next Saturday in Houston against the number one team in the country. Ain't nobody playing a little tiny violin for us feeling sorry. For <laughs> it is what it is. We got to be tough. We got to rise up. And then once you get done next week, no more road games. You got neutral sites, obviously, the Big 12 tournament. A lot of basketball yet to be played. We've proven that we can beat the best teams in the country. Better than anybody else in the country as far as our big wins. Now, we've given up some gimmies. Or, you know, we go back to we're, we're at the point we're at right now because of Orlando, because of Manhattan, because of Morgantown. That's why we're at where we're at. So that's water under the bridge. We got an opportunity tomorrow to play against a, another top 20 team and see if we can get that monkey off our back. Hey, and to sum up all of what uh, you said and, and, and rightly said, I love the, the tiny violin uh, imagery that you laid out there. To sum it all up, I'll sum it up in two words. It's March. It's March. Like, March. It's supposed to be hard. Everyone's gonna want it. Like it's it's March, so let's uh, let's let's get after it. Let's enjoy it. No matter what your bracket is, guess what? You got to beat good teams to advance. So might as well start looking at tomorrow, like first round of the NCAA tournament, and and get that mindset. And uh, however you want to prepare yourself, uh, we got to do it. We're gonna have a bad taste in our mouth because of what happened on Tuesday, and hopefully we play a little angry. Hopefully we're pissed off. I know Hunter is. I was out there yesterday watching him, and he was he was getting up thousands of shots, free throw line, three pointers, mid rangers. He's working at it. There's no question about it. It's not like he's sitting around all fat and happy. Pissed him off. Of course it did. You know it pissed you off. It pissed me off. Hey, he didn't play like we know he can play, but he can change all that, and and it's going to take all of his teammates and everybody to play a game for 40 minutes and go accomplish what you set out to accomplish. So I'm looking forward to it. I love, I love broadcasting games and hostile environments that you go play well and you can kind of wave to everybody and wave to that dry erase board guy. And maybe I can grab his board and write. I, that's what I want to do. I'm going to grab his board after we win and write scoreboard on it. What do you think? Uh, that that could be Malice at the Palace Part Two. Maybe maybe, maybe not in Waco, but uh, yeah. That, Are you gonna travel with us today? I, I might need you as like my wingman. You know what? I would love to, but I'm gonna be here on Saturday in the field house uh, for Senior Day with women's basketball. I'll be on the call, uh, ESPN Plus with uh, with Josh Klingler, and so uh, hopefully Jayhawk Faithful. Uh, and the games are offset. And so you can catch both. And so hopefully we'll have some folks show up in the field house. Had a great crowd against K-State, nearly 10,000 people. Uh, hopefully we'll duplicate that on Saturday for this incredible senior class. 
as they take on the uh, the Big 12 champions. And uh, so, so that's where I'll be. You'll, you'll have to find other security uh, down there. Have, have Q. Coach Q will have to run security for you. They're putting that face on television? Well, you know, I'm only on, a, you know, 30 seconds, and then they get to the real to the real action. You going to go get a fresh cut before the game? Not before the game. Thursday. Thursdays is my haircut day. Okay. Yeah, you look good. Thank you. Really, really impressive. All right. Have fun on Saturday. Send those seniors out right. Playing against a, a top 25 Oklahoma team that uh, – uh, obviously you're going to put up a good fight. And if we go into March, go into the big 12 tournament winners of eight of nine, that only strengthens our NCAA tournament bid. And along with what I talked about earlier with the strength of schedule early on in the year, hopefully that gets us over the hump because, uh, as cool as it was last year, the natural progression is get to the NCAA tournament this year, right? Yeah, the WNIT championship is the one championship you don't want to defend because that means you miss the NCAA tournament and uh, and you're in the wrong bracket. But uh certainly feel like the KU women are trending uh, towards the big dance uh, within the NCAA tournament, and they can add to that uh, confidence by taking care of business on Saturday. Jericho Podcast brought to you by the University of Kansas Health System, Black and Veach, and Xfinity. I am Greg Gurley. That is Wayne Simeon. Catch him on ESPN Plus on Saturday for the women's game. Catch me on the radio along with Brian Haney on Saturday as well at noon central time in Waco, Texas. And when we're back next week, hopefully we're on a two-game winning streak. The women have won eight of nine. It's all just – Baseball uh, has a homestand coming up. So hopefully baseball, Coach Dan Fitzgerald gets a couple home wins. So hopefully it'll all be right in the world once you come back next week just rainbows and butterflies it's going to be beautiful everything's right in the world right mostly yeah mostly. <laughs> all right jericho podcast rock chop